So uh, I'm not an IP lawyer, um, so I'm going to broaden this out into a, a more global and policy frame. Um, stepping out further sort of beyond IP, um, a point that I've been that I made in a book that, that came out last year and, and that I've kind of been arguing for a while is is that the evolution of the global internet is at a real crossroads right now, um, both in terms of how its technical architecture evolves, how its regulatory frameworks evolve that determine what people can and cannot do on, uh, on their digital platforms and devices, uh, and, and also the business norms uh, and, and practices that end up shaping what people can and cannot do uh, on digital platforms and services. And it's a real open question whether or not uh, this digital realm upon which citizens are increasingly dependent for their civic and political and religious and economic and all other aspects of their lives, uh, whether it's going to evolve in a manner that will be compatible with human rights uh, and with democracy uh, and, and with accountable governance generally. Uh, whether whether it will evolve in a manner that is compatible with human rights, both in terms of uh, protection uh, and of realization of, of human rights. It's a real open question. And uh, particularly what happens in terms of lawmaking and policymaking in the democratic world today is going to shape dramatically where this goes. Uh, and there's a tremendous responsibility and we've seen these huge fights going on where human rights groups tr traditionally have not been very focused on IP law. Uh, and, and a number of groups that I've uh, worked with pretty closely um, uh, over the years are really new to IP and have had to catch up closely because there's been a real wake up call that they have to engage in this area um, before it's too late. Um, but we have a real challenge in, you know, reading the newspapers, you know that the, the fight of the day is actually over cybersecurity, but many of the challenges are, are the same in terms of we have problems that need to be dealt with on the internet uh, in, in terms of uh, balancing various interests and legitimate needs, whether it's fighting crime, whether it's securing networks, whether it's protecting intellectual property of people who have a right to you know, uh, remuneration for their creative works, uh, or whether it's protecting children, whether it's dealing with hate speech, whether it's uh, dealing with harassment, you know, that it just, a litany of things, uh, real problems that constituencies uh, in the democratic world and around the world more broadly are, are crying out for solutions, uh, legislative solutions, policy solutions. And one of the problems has been um, that legislators and, and policymakers tend to deal with each problem quite narrowly. Uh, and so in the run-up, for instance, uh, to the Stop Online Piracy Act and Protect IP um, Act uh, fight uh, and ultimate defeat of, of that legislation, um, I was part of some conversations with some, uh, some staffers in, in Congress uh, over uh, uh, the drafting of, of these bills. And it was pretty clear that the people involved with drafting IP-related legislation were not talking to people involved with internet freedom and human rights and, and so on, that, that it was completely compartmentalized. Uh, and, and so I actually was in a conversation where a few of us, including some human rights groups, asked a staffer, uh, did you know, your office also has another staffer working on internet freedom. Did you guys talk to each other at all? No. Um, that in drafting this, you know, we, we saw this as a jobs issue. You know, so so the, so this this is one of the problems just in, in terms of the lawmaking process. And, and actually, in some congressional testimony I gave uh, a year or so ago, I, I said, look, you know, we really need to have human rights impact assessment conducted on. In bills um, related that that intend to solve any particular problem on the internet, um, but what it comes down to really at the end of the day, and uh, the reason why the global human rights community 
came out so strongly, not only against SOPA and PIPA, but against the uh, Anti-Counterfeiting um, Trade Act, and why people are coming out against uh, uh, some aspects of the TPP and so on has to do with this problem that's been raised by many of the panelists, the concern that the law in, in its effort to uh, resolve problems um, is going to open the way for abuse, is going to decrease accountability, is going to make it more possible for power to be abused um, in, in ways that cannot be constrained. And so this is a broader policy making issue that goes beyond IP, but just in all internet legislative and policy making challenges we face today, first of all, how do you address you know, problem X, IP, cybersecurity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, hate speech, et cetera. How, how do you resolve it in a way or address it in a way that does, does not expand the potential for abuse of power, um, that has adequate checks and balances, and that has adequate transparency around how the power is being exercised. Um, if, if you cannot know when power is being abused, if you cannot hold that power accountable, if the public is, is not able to even see how see and anticipate how that power will be abused, uh, democracy is, is increasingly uh, corroded. Uh, and any and, and, and the knock-on effects in the less democratic parts of the world in that Freedom House chart that we saw, you know, was sort of uh, there, there, there are a lot of, of countries where uh, either they're, they're uh, more transitional democracies or newer democracies or places where rule of law is, is less solid, the adoption of the norms that the democratic world adopts um, uh, within the context of legal systems and political systems where there's even less accountability um, uh, creates a knock-on effect uh, where basically, basically the ability of people to use technology to speak out and to, to hold government accountable will become more and more difficult over time because the possibility, the normalization of mechanisms uh, to censor, to surveil without sufficient accountability will become more and more technically and legally entrenched in international treaties, global norms, and so on. Uh, and and the, uh, an example of this, and, and I talk about this bit in my book, um, on the more extreme end, uh, it has to do with China. And uh, the fact that, um, actually there's, there's a book I highly recommend uh, around intellectual property enforcement in China by um, a professor named Andrew Murtha at Cornell University. Um, he published a book in 2005, The Politics of Piracy, Intellectual Property in Contemporary China, and I recommend it. And he, he very interestingly documents the, the evolution of intellectual property law in China and intellectual property enforcement, and points out that you know, China only started uh, setting up its intellectual property regime in the 1980s after China opened, began to open up its economy to the outside world. But it got a real boost in 1989 after the Tiananmen Square crackdown. Uh, because very interestingly, uh, shortly after the crackdown, the US was really stepping up its efforts to enforce IP protection in East Asia. And this was a very convenient confluence as far as the Chinese Communist Party was concerned, which was also identifying, you know, in its post-mortem about how things got out of control in 1989, the fact that they had had inadequate control over publications and cultural works and, and, and uh, so on, uh, and that a crackdown on IP was a very convenient way to crack down on all infringing content. And of course, in China, infringing content, uh, infringing is defined in a much broader way. So as, as Martha shows, uh, and as some other research has also shown, 
uh, and Peter Yu is here, and, and he runs something called the Chinese Internet Research Conference. And over the years, there have been a number of academics who presented papers on kind of the, the types of content that end up getting swept up in, in kind of file sharing crackdowns and, and things like that. But what, what we've seen is every time that there's an intellectual property crackdown in China, and you know, I'm not going to dispute that there are issues in China around intellectual property. That's kind of a separate conversation. But the fact of the matter is, every time there's an intellectual property crackdown in China, it's used as a convenient excuse to crack down on all sorts of political speech, plus porn, plus you know, various other things. Um, so the fact, and, and another thing that's, I think, overlooked is that, you know, as the State Department is pushing internet freedom in China, you also have the USDR and, and the Department of Commerce and the commercial section of the U.S. Embassy pushing Chinese internet companies, uh, Chinese ministries to crack, to, to crack down on IP and implement mechanisms to make IP enforcement easier. And those mechanisms actually, as it so happens, also make it easier to monitor and censor content and you know this kind of thing. And so. Not surprisingly, like many governments around the world, the Chinese government puts more weight on what the U.S. does as opposed to what the U.S. says and where the U.S. is putting most of its resources as opposed to where it's talking nicely. Uh, and uh, the resources uh, are, are going in a direction that is less free expression oriented um, or that certainly is not so inconvenient for other objectives. Um, and, and I think that's, that's often not understood here in Washington, that dynamic, because everything is so compartmentalized. The people doing trade and IP, people doing human rights, um, free expression, you know, don't seem to really coordinate much. Um, or, or if they do, the ones with the biggest lobbies behind them seem to win out. Um, and also, uh, another, I think, uh, useful reference um, on this kind of broader context is um, a publication that came out in uh, 2011 called Media Piracy in Emerging Economies, published by the Social Science Research Council and edited by Joe Carganis, which documented um, it was looking at U.S. intellectual property enforcement trade policies in Russia, Brazil, India, South Africa, Bolivia, and Mexico. And it documented how U.S. entertainment and software industries with U.S. government support are pushing for, quote, expanded police powers and the wider application of criminal law. So, you know, this is disturbing. <laughs> Uh, and, and it's an example of how the balance or the accommodation or whatever we want to, to, to call it is, is taking the world in a direction that is not compatible with human rights, either in its protection or in its realization. Uh, and that uh, hopefully both the, the world of IP scholarship and activism and, and so on. Uh, and I think it's, it's really important what you guys are doing with your principles and, and the timing is, is really key uh, with the TPP <laughs> negotiations, as you mentioned, and everything else. Um, it's time to really, I think, in, in our democratic societies to push our governments to get this right and to be holistic in their approach. And that if IP law, if IP enforcement, if trade policy, trade agreements are not human rights compatible, it does not bode well. So we'll leave it for that.